Episcopal Church, the Unitarian Church, the Academy, uh, Phillips Exeter Academy, and Water Street bookstores. And as a result, after tonight's program, we will have books for sale in this room right here. So don't head out that front door. <laughs> head out this way and duck in there, and uh, our guest tonight will be happy to sign books. And now, uh, oh, I should tell you that our purpose is that we have lectures and films at the intersection of uh, political events, current events, I should say, um, ethics, and religion. And tonight, we're pleased to have someone from the Academy, Betty Luther Hillman, who's from the History Department here at the Academy, introduce our speaker. speaking at the Academy uh, at our assembly tomorrow, so it's a little more personal than maybe I would have done um, for folks that I don't necessarily know, but I think that's okay, um, because you might have read Michelle's bio, and, or perhaps you've even read the book, so you know a bit about her. Um, so um, Michelle and I were friends in college, so uh, I was super excited to not only read her book, but have the opportunity to invite her here to Exeter. Um, so, for a little bit of introduction, I'm honored to introduce scholar and author Michelle Kuo. Ms. Kuo earned degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and she is the recipient of the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship, the Scadden Fellowship, and a clerkship on the Federal Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. She currently teaches at the American University in Paris. Anyone in the know is aware that these are high accolades, achievements that are expected of a Harvard graduate. Ms. Kuo's memoir, Reading with Patrick, which was published this past summer, is a testament to the insignificance of these accolades when considering one's daily life and the importance of human connection, not titles. Michelle and I were friends in college, and we talked about our shared interest in teaching as a path to achieving social justice in our careers. We followed similar paths after college. Um, Michelle, as you will hear, taught in Arkansas for Teach for America, um, and I taught at a charter school in Washington, D.C. Um, like Michelle, I truly feel that teaching in D.C. changed the course of my life, and not a day goes by that I don't think about my students in our school. I'm in touch with one or two of them on Facebook, so I know that some of my students went to college, and some did not. Some are now parents, and some of my students were parents back then as teenagers. A few of them are no longer alive. Ms. Kuo's book is a memoir of her time living in Arkansas, teaching African American students as an Asian American woman, and returning several years later during her last year of law school, when she found out that Patrick, her former student, had been arrested and imprisoned for murder. Her book ponders the histories of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system that shaped Patrick's life, and her own responsibility for trying to correct these historical injustices. It is also a book about the power of literature to forge human connections, even between two people as seemingly different as Michelle and Patrick. Two of my favorite quotes from the book are when Michelle asks, what have I done in my life that has cost me anything? Later in the book, Patrick offers what I think is something of a response, that the only way we're gonna overcome is by thinking about it. Please join me in welcoming Michelle the book. She was known for being an incredibly steady, brilliant presence. Um, and I also knew her husband. We worked together on a magazine that was before its time, ahead of its time. That's the phrase, very bad with prepositions, um, with idioms, because of my memory of parents. Uh, I'm always like saying the wrong idiom. But uh, Ben, is, it's so nice to see Ben again. Um, such a thoughtful person. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book and the story behind it and why it was so difficult for me to write. Um, and then I want to leave time for questions because I'd love to hear your thoughts 
and impressions during this very polarizing time. Um, I went to the Arkansas Delta, which is a rural and poor part of America when I was 22. I had grown up, I thought, with a quite boring and prosaic childhood. I was one of the few Asian Americans in a quite welcoming community in suburban Michigan. Uh, my parents were from Taiwan. I played the piano, of course. I wanted to be the best piano player, but there were two other Asian girls who were better than me. Um, and I studied very hard for my classes. And when I made it to Harvard, my parents thought that my life was set. All I had to do was go and be a doctor. <laughs> My first rebellion was to not become a doctor. My second was um, to decide to major in non-natural sciences, which was a blow to my parents. My mother is still very depressed I'm not a doctor. And uh, the third rebellion was to become a teacher. And it's interesting that in Chinese culture, being a teacher is something that used to be so revered, um, but they probably had internalized American ideas by the time they came saw that they were of lower status and reward. When I went to Arkansas, I was 22, I didn't care what my parents thought. I just wanted to change the world, like any idealistic and sheltered 22-year-old. And I thought I would start at this alternative school that I was assigned to. It was called a dumping ground for other students. It was for students who had been kicked out, who got into fights, who talked back to their teachers, who were held back. So I had a lot of 8th graders who were 15 or 16 years old. And that's when I met Patrick. <coughs> the book is about Patrick, but it's also about so much more. Um, it's about the students that I met who had incredible potential, but were often written off as bad kids and as tough kids. My first year of teaching was a series of humiliating mistakes, and part of what made the book so difficult was just to see that 22-year-old straight in the face. Um, one of the first things that I did was attempt to teach the history of violence against black people to black students, thinking that I was being very progressive and transgressive in doing so. This was a town where majority of the people are black, where the people of means, both black and white, have left the town, and that it is so wholly shaped by the history of slavery. We sometimes think of slavery as very distant, but when you go to some of these rural towns, you can really feel that was the history, that the legacy has come from the control of agriculture over the town and the collapse of agriculture, leaving black laborers without work, and leaving the land to be consolidate, consolidated by large multinational uh, national companies. The students I met when I thought that I was teaching them about the history of black violence didn't want to learn about it. And one of the first stories that I tell in the book is of passing around a picture of a lynching and wanting the students to become indignant or outraged in the same way that I had as a young kid learning about this history. One of my students responded exactly as a teacher hopes. He says, that's not right, Ms. Quo, what happened, where was this? But another one of my students, James, just put his head down. And when I went to talk to him, he said, no, don't nobody want to look at that, Ms. Quo. And I thought to myself that as a progressive, we hear a lot about things to be angry about, about white supremacy, about the history of black violence. But when you're a teacher in a classroom, you don't want to just push students. You want to create a place of safety, of refuge, a feeling of absolute individuality and freedom from these painful stories of the past. And I said to myself, I'm going to start over. I'm going to learn how to do this in a different way. I looked around the classroom and put up all of these posters of black heroes that I wanted them to emulate, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, Martin Luther King. And there was something missing. It was actually, what was missing was pictures of themselves. And so I started with teaching them how to write poetry about themselves, about their own lives. I realized you couldn't fill them with heroes that you thought they should contain, 
they themselves live in a place that is so detached from the reality of, of, of black achievement. They began to write poems about themselves, and I blew these poems up to poster size, as large as these posters of these heroes. I started to blow up pictures of themselves. To, I would drive to Kinko's in Memphis, which was an hour away, and come back um, with these huge posters, and students would come into the class looking for the pictures of themselves. The second thing that I did was institute silent reading in the class. This was probably the most magical and wonderful time as a teacher, not just because I was sitting there reading. <laughs> um, but you realize how much students crave, as all people crave, peace and time and meditation. These are kids who are known to, or said to be rowdy and crazy and unable to sit still. And yet, for a magical 20 minutes, three times a week, they were absolutely still. They were entering a different world, different places. Many of them had never left the small town in Arkansas, had never crossed the bridge to Mississippi. And it was powerful to me to understand that a classroom is a place of quiet. It's not a place where the teacher talks all the time. I took pictures also of themselves reading so that they could see what they looked like, absolutely absorbed and quiet and interior. And I told them that this is what books can do. It can calm you down. It can bring you to a different place. And I also found that students, surprise, I mean, this is a really embarrassing thing to admit, but they had a variety of tastes. I wanted wanting to teach James Baldwin and the African American literature I connected to as a child. Um, but that's not what everybody wanted to read. Somebody wanted to read, um, you know, a Kung Fu novel. Another person wanted to learn about where China was from. Uh, I mean, where, you know, where I was from, and then they started to look up stuff on China and Taiwan. Another person wanted to read science fiction. And that seems really obvious, but. Um, to me, it was also another sign of the absolute individuality of a person. And you have to help a student understand and see that they can love something that nobody else loves. Patrick was a student who I never had to push very hard to read. He was naturally introspective. He was very quiet. And when students got into a fight, he actually tried to break them up. There are a lot of things that are hard with education. There are no silver bullets. But one thing that's absolutely astounding to me with Patrick is how easy some things were. Um, he had one problem. The reason why he got sent to our school was attendance. And I just went to his house one day when he hadn't showed up. I was like, hey, where were you? And he looked shocked to see a teacher come after him for not coming to school. Um, and, our, and our school system had a really incompetent truancy officer who didn't actually go to the truant houses. So he came to school the next day, and the next day, and that year he made incredible achievement. And I thought to myself, okay, uh, maybe one adult in a small rural town can't really make that big of a difference in terms of just holding another person accountable. At the end of that year, it was my second year of teaching, Patrick had won a Most Improved Student Award. I had promised him that I would wait to see him graduate from high school, and I've learned now not to make promises so readily to people. It's something I do, I think, and it's the spur of the moment without thinking. And I was trying to decide whether I should actually stay for a few more years in this place, or people of means always, almost always leave, and people without means almost always stay behind. I had gotten into Harvard Law School, and to my immigrant parents from Taiwan, who were extremely immigrant, and a really dramatic moment in the book is when I decide I'm gonna tell my parents that I'm going to stay. My, par my friends and I are strategizing, we're thinking, we're like, okay, Parents arrive May 1st. This is the big moment. We're going to show them all the best parts of this town. We're going to show them the classroom. 
We've organized this huge fundraiser where they're singing and dancing, and we're gonna convince my parents that it's not a bad idea to defer law school for a few more years. What's the, what's the rush? There's no rush. So my parents come, and first they come to the fundraiser, and my dad is swaying to the gospel music, and I'm thinking good thoughts. Then my parents come to the classroom, and my dad, so I, I also taught an after school math program, my dad goes up to the board and starts like helping students do math, and he's the opposite of me, he's blunt and direct, and he's like, no, you're doing this absolutely wrong, I'm gonna show you how to do this. So the kids like love him, they love that bluntness, um, they love being told they're wrong and getting the faster way. And I'm feeling a lot of hope, I'm like, okay, my parents really get it, and they, they go around looking at the poems on the classroom walls. And I gather up the courage uh, the night before they leave to say, um, I'm thinking about staying for a couple more years just to see this. I finally figured out this teaching thing. I just want to stay for a couple more years. And my parents, um, they, their faces crumble. My dad starts yelling at me. Um, I actually sanitized a lot of the stuff in the book. It's much worse than the book. <laughs> just because I knew they wouldn't have to read the book. Um, my, you know, my mom started uh, crying. My dad said a lot of things. He said, you're a lot smarter than this. You're smarter than being here. You can do better things. Do you really want to stay here in the middle of nowhere? And he kind of gestured to the town with this kind of I wouldn't call it condescension, but a kind of desperation. Like, my, I've, I've come all the way to this country so that my daughter can come to the worst part of it. And, and I just knew in that moment that I wasn't going to let my parents down. I'd, also, I'd already let them down in so many ways that I couldn't, and I thought of myself as really strong, but I just, just didn't want to do it to them. My parents said to me, we promise that if you go to law school, we'll never bother you again. <laughs> I wish I had tape recorded that conversation because I completely forgot that they made this promise. I think I'm like good enough now. Um, they're like, oh, you're a writer, you're such a big imagination. We never made that promise. Um, so uh, it's so funny, you know. My friends who are American always say to me that I'm such a. They're like, you're such a little girl around your parents. You're you're over 18. You're independent. Um, and my Asian friends completely know that we're always our parents' children. Even when we're 40 or 50, there's always a sense of if you don't obey, then you're, you're, you don't really love them. Um, so I felt that way. I went to law school. Fast forward three years, I'm trying to decide whether to go to a corporate firm or do public interest law, and my parents have totally forgotten this promise. And we have the same fight, like history completely repeats itself. Nobody changes. I'm not sure what I want to do. They know what I should do. And I'm like, wow, this is serious. Nobody progressed. So but I wanted to progress. I wanted to grow as a person. And I think um, what Betty said in introduction really struck me, the insignificance of these accolades. A lot of these things that I, a lot of these prizes I was accumulating was also a way to package and explain to my parents who I was. I remember um, getting some award and, ex and being like, look, see, this is, this is why I do public service, even though that's not why I do public service. And that's when I found out from a friend that Patrick had gotten into a fight and killed someone. I thought it had to be a mistake, I was devastated. I thought it had to be a different Patrick because a Patrick I knew, I was absolutely sure, was not violent. He was a peaceful guy who stayed to himself. Um, but I think now that my own determination that it couldn't have been Patrick was also revealed my own middle class upbringing. You know, this uh, an ability to understand that anybody can be swallowed up in difficult and violent situations if you were put in that situation. Um, it's not so much a matter of personality as the tests that we are put through. And the test that Patrick had, put, had been put through was this. I got the story three days later when I flew to visit him in an Arkansas County Jail. And the story was that his mother had asked him to look for his younger sister, who was 15, special ed, so a little slow. 
And it was late on a school night, and Patrick really um, was going to every house that had a party. A lot of these houses are having parties and serving alcohol. Um, and he couldn't find her. And when he got back to his house, right when he got to his porch, he saw an older man who was known to be very aggressive and drunk, um, extremely inebriated with his younger sister. He was 25, she was 15. And he kept telling this man to get off his porch, and the man wouldn't get off the porch. And Patrick was very scared. He took out a knife and stabbed him three times. And the man limped away, so Patrick thought the man was fine. It took the ambulance a really long time to come, because it's rural Helena, and there's one ambulance. And the man died. What, what, how do we make sense of this one night that totally changed Patrick's life? He was 18, both were African American, both lived on the same street that's known to be the roughest street in the town. Both were high school dropouts at that point because Patrick had dropped out the year after I left. Patrick told me that his parents had come to visit him in jail, but he told them to stop coming because it was too hard on them. His lawyer hadn't contacted him because a public defender has over 100 cases and isn't given any resources to investigate or any financial incentives. He was utterly alone. And I was trying to figure out what to do with my own life. I thought of myself as a good person. I think we would like to think of ourselves as good people. Um, I had, at that point, chosen to do public interest law. I was going to be a legal aid lawyer in California. But there, I think there are moments in your life, there are crossroads, or there are tests, where your idea of your own goodness utterly collapses. I think it can happen at any point to you, whether it's when you betray a friend, or you just fall behind, or you just feel like you aren't living up to your own ideas. And this was my moment where my idea of my goodness like, totally collapsed. I was like, I made a promise to this kid. I've chosen a comfortable life. This kid is utterly alone, he's just a kid. I should just go back and figure out how to be with him. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't even have a legal skills in Arkansas. So I called my employer in California and said I need to, I need, I need to delay this, feeling extremely unreliable. Um, and then I went back to Arkansas. And this is really the heart of this extraordinary seven months where Patrick and I start to read together. Um, this happens totally on accident. He has, I find out, a baby daughter. And I'm feeling very teacherly and smart. So I'm like, oh, why don't you write a letter to your daughter telling her how you are, thinking that this will help him put her on his mind, help him write. But when I see what the letter he's actually written the next day, it totally astounds me. Um, I didn't understand that literacy skills can regress so much after you drop out. They were worse than when I had been a teacher. His handwriting was jagged. Um, he couldn't spell basic words. And worst of all, the letter was mostly a, a repetition of apology. I'm sorry for not being there for you. I'm sorry that I let you down. And I thought to myself, how do I get him to write a letter where he feels worthwhile, like a worthwhile person to know? And that's really why we started to read, because without reading, without entering other worlds and becoming different, how else was he going to become a different person? We read The Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. We read Frederick Douglass, we read so much poetry, more poetry than I've ever read in my life. Um, and we started to memorize poetry as well. And he knew these beautiful poems by heart. One of the enduring questions in the book is, how is reading alone different from reading together? I think we all, many of us here are readers. Thank you, independent booksellers who help us read. Um, and we always buy books from independent bookstores. Uh, but how many of us remember the feeling of staying up reading all night? And how many of us have had people read to us? And how many of us have read to others? These are precious 
sacred experiences of reading to one another. They're intimate and you're telling stories to each other. But it doesn't happen very much in rural places and poor places because books are expensive, because there are no books. Um, in all the studies of book desert, deserts, there's perhaps one book for um, 300 children in areas like these, uh, just in terms of pure libraries and bookstores. And I realized that he hadn't really had this experience of, of reading together. And I honestly had it either. I thought, started thinking about myself, and it was the first time I really thought I finally started thinking about being Asian American. I've always thought of myself as having grown up relatively privileged, because I had parents who were educated, went to a good public school where people who were properly paid. Um, and I am. I think one of the things I like about my book is that I'm really honest about that privilege. But one way, is, one way in which I wasn't was just in, um, having stories read to me and stories about me. And reading with Patrick together, I started thinking a lot about how you learn so much more about yourself and your own experiences when you're reading together. So how many of us have read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? Yes, beautiful story, right? And so when I grew up reading that story, I just, do you not like that book? Okay, it's okay. It is, it is true. Uh, but I still, I still love the book. Sorry, I'm very sensitive to audience faces. No, you're fine. Um, we don't all have to love the same book. It's part of my message, so it's good, actually. Um, so when I read the book, of course, I identified with Lucy, and of course, right, the young heroine who outsmarts the witch and knows better than her siblings and finds the wardrobe. And when Patrick read the book, you can imagine for a second, who he identified with, um, with Edmund, with the kid who betrays his siblings and leaves them behind and gets tricked. And he kept turning the pages to see if Edmund got redemption, to see if he was forgiven. And when he got to the chapter about Edmund um, outsmarting the witch and knocking the wand out of her hand, he, he stopped to read that chapter again. When we read Frederick Douglass together, I had thought of the book as an uplifting story of a man who literally wrote his past to freedom, who escaped slavery, became one of the most important people in American history. Um, and Patrick experienced the book entirely differently. Um, when he got to the section where the masters give gin to the slaves over the holidays in order to trick them into believing that they don't deserve freedom because they stumble drunk on the fields. Um, Patrick had a lot of trouble continuing to read because he so identified with that. He identified with the feeling of not deserving freedom. And he talked about how he, his inmates, fellow inmates, um, were drunk and stumbling inside, and I felt so profoundly the connection between the book and our lives. But it's probably reading poetry that gave me the most hope of all. Um, there's a Derek Walcott poem called Love After Love that Patrick really took to. Uh, it begins like this. There, there will be a time that will come when you greet yourself at the door in the mirror and each will smile at one another's welcome. Another poem by W.S. Merwin, where um, Merwin wrote this poem to his wife when he realized that they, were, they would spend the rest of their lives together. And he writes, let me imagine that we will come again when we want to, and it will be spring. We will be no older than we ever were. The warm griefs will have eased like the early cloud through which morning slowly comes to itself. And I remember asking Patrick, as I always did, like, what is your favorite line? Because it's a way to open up conversation, to not 
impose your own ideas of what it's about. And he said his favorite line was, we will be no older than we ever were. And I asked why, and he said, it reminds me of a time where time just stops, where time doesn't matter anymore. And he said it made him think of his mother, because um, he was extremely close to his mother. Um, thought of his mother as a place that lasts forever. By the end of these seven months, Patrick was writing these extraordinary letters, exquisite letters to his daughter, um, imagining them going canoeing down the Mississippi, writing her poems, re imagining him reading to her. And his handwriting had utterly transformed too. It was um, like a, a font, uh, just these beautiful, heartbreaking letters. And that was at the point where I left Arkansas a second time. The book doesn't quite end there. If I had ended there, it would have um, maybe been an, a more solidly uplifting story. But the story continues, where Patrick does get out. And I thought to myself that when Patrick got out, things would be better. And it's funny how we don't change as people. That was naive of me. Um, life was perhaps more excruciating in a different way for him because as a felon, he couldn't get a job because rural Arkansas still is difficult because his mother, his dearest friend, passed away shortly after he got out and she was his tie to a home. She died at 43 of heart disease and diabetes, where, which had the highest rates in the Delta. So he was again alone, and I was again not in Arkansas. And that is really where the book ends. It, it ends on, and some people find the book incredibly depressing, others tell me it's incredibly hopeful. I don't know which it is. Um, there is no doubt that I utterly changed his experience of incarceration. I feel confident of that. That's why I wrote the book, to record this experience of total transformation. And total, I had total fear that if I didn't write it down, it didn't happen. But I didn't change his material circumstances after he got out. And I wanted to be honest about that so that all of us together could think about what collective action looks like to change these laws, to work on our own communities, to welcome ex-felons, or the formerly incarcerated, as I guess we're supposed to call them now. Um, and I, I have more questions than answers at the end, um, but I'd love to hear your questions. And thank you so much for being here, and for being such an attentive presence. I can, I can feel you all with me, which is so nice. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to comment that it's not just the Asian children that are brought up. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. I know my friend, my, I have a dear friend whose parents are great. They're like dads of a Episcopalian. Maybe it's a different Pastor and her mom. It's a different generation. Yeah. A different generation. Do you mean, do you mean other parents also wouldn't have wanted would have told their kids to go to law school and move? Yeah. I had a parent that wanted me to finish uh, nurses' training. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe just anxiety of the kids losing their way. Is that it? I chose marriage. <laughs> it was even harder. <laughs> Yes, in the back. You leave us to believe that life has not improved for Patrick. Are you still in touch with him? I am in touch with him a lot. So it's hard, you know, his life goes on. Um, he's had ups and downs. He had some permanent jobs uh, in Paragold, which is in the north, and that was great. But then, like the 
factory closed down or something, and then he struggled again. So it's, it's ups and downs. The happiest news, which I feel so happy about, is that his daughter is doing really well. And that's where his hope is. She's a fourth grader at a KIPP school in Helena. I know charter schools are very controversial, but I personally am really happy that she's doing well at a school that takes care of her, that has one of the highest test grades in the school where she, um, and um, I talked to her teachers and she has really good reading and math scores. So, and he sees her, he's a, he's, he's a present dad. So that is great. That is good news. Um, bad news is jobs. He still has trouble. I, I still don't totally know all the details of whether he himself drops out of the jobs or whether there's just a pure lack. Um, the promising things that happen from the book is some people in Little Rock, uh, friends of friends, contact me and have job prospects for him and church groups for him in Little Rock and he's just moved to Little Rock, so knock on wood. I don't, I, I think I'm always, I always like I'm, try to sound pessimistic so that I don't try to sound too positive, you know, to make myself look good, so it's like confusing what the real story is, but I think there's, there's good news. Yeah, his daughter's well and he's not in jail and he's still trying to find a job. These are good things, but it's not, it's not the story that we, we want to hear that settles us, you know. Yeah. How is that? Is that, is that fair? Does that seem honest? Okay. <laughs> this question always makes me nervous because I want to be as transparent as possible. Yes, there's a question in the back. Yeah. That was my question. Is how, yeah, how he's doing. Yeah. yeah. The story goes on, I think. He's still really young, is also what I tell myself. He's still, he's still young, a young man. Yes, question. Uh, a lot of your story was a lot about just, I guess, from what I interpreted, sort of connecting with the African American community in these places. And I'm wondering just about sort of, since, since like as an Asian American myself, I sometimes find that I have very complex relationships with other people of color from other minority communities. And I'm wondering if you've ever had any, um, how to word this, I guess, conflicting experiences with other people from other groups of color, and if that has ever sort of complicated your motivations for helping the African American community in the world. Yes, I have a lot of thoughts about that. So one thing that I realized, which I don't only realized as I was writing the book, so in the past five years, is how much I would have been a better teacher connecting to African American communities if I had been more comfortable with myself, with my own background. Um, I was really defensive when kids, I mean kids will always try to get on whatever, whatever you look like. If you're fat, the kids will tell you you're fat. You know, if you're, if you like have a funny shirt, they'll tell you, you know, they will always get nervous. So of course they were going to point out that I was Asian, so they were, they would say, you know, they would try to get on my nerves. I mean some of them were genuinely just lacking in contact because few immigrants went there. I was one of the few Asians, but others would be like, oh, Ms. Kuo, are you related to Yao Ming? <laughs> and I just, I would get really upset or not know what to say, but by my second year, I was so much more comfortable with myself. I was like, well, are you related to Kobe Bryant? And then they'd be like, wait, that's racist. Yeah, like, exactly. But, um, yeah. And, but even now, I think I would have been even better now as a teacher with different communities because I would have known what to share about myself. I didn't know very much about being Asian American when I was 22. I really didn't. My parents didn't tell me anything about Taiwan. They wanted me to be American and they didn't grow up with history of Taiwan because it was an authoritarian regime that didn't want people to learn their own history, you know. Um, my Chinese isn't very good. I could have just shared and that would have, students are so thirsty for knowledge about other worlds and that could have been a point of contact. And if they had made fun of it, I wouldn't have cared because I would have been confident. And it's, 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 it's a lesson for all of us to know ourselves because then we don't care if people try to trample on it. Um, and I think with, when you interact with people who are really different from yourself, they respect your self-knowledge. And they respect you when you say, I don't know anything. You know, I don't know you. I, I don't know you. Like, I want to learn, though. That, that is the spirit of the book. 
you know. Um, and that's when I became a better teacher was when I actually said that to students, I, I don't know what you go through. And to look at them in the eye when you say that. Um, but this is a really polarizing time where I think even progressives are really alienating. They, you know, I, I find it so disheartening just how oh, progressives seem to have lost hope in actual interracial solidarity. You know, there seems to be this attitude that white people should shut up and that oh, Asians should only talk about Asian solidarity rather than with other groups and black people should, um, you know, hunker down. I, I get where these, this comes from, but it's part of the, the dream when Obama was elected. I mean, I know it's been exposed now, but the dream was that this was possible. And that dream was possible in the 1960s is partly why I went to Arkansas, is that so many white, Asian, some Asians, mostly white and black, went, traveled down south to take part in a movement and took risks together, you know. Um, and it seems to me part of that spirit has been lost. But maybe I'm being a little pessimistic. I don't want to be pessimistic. <laughs> yes, question? I think my question might build on the last one. You've mentioned transparency several times, and so where does that come from? That's a good question. Like, my family, or? Well, you want to be transparent, straightforward, totally honest, you know, how, that seems, that has some difficulty behind it, I guess. Yeah, that has some, sorry? Difficulty. Yeah, I think, um, Well, my family has a lot of conflict, so I think there's always been transparency. <laughs> but I, I, I think at some point, maybe in college, I realized, and I did some work like with diverse communities in college, and it seems to me the only way you can connect with people is by being increasingly vulnerable, that your relationships are deeper with people, the more honest you are about your limitations. This is an insight from religious communities that sometimes doesn't get transferred outward. And it seems to me that a lot of conflicts, at least for me, within liberal circles, come from people trying to prove how liberal they are to each other by becoming increasingly loud and insistent and attacking. And for me, that's just not me, and that's not the spirit of what humility and dialogue looks like. But, and I, I think also the transparency comes from the discomfort of writing a book about somebody with less power and less privilege than myself. Um, it seems to me that the only way you could write a book like that or dare to write a book is by being absolutely honest about yourself and your mistakes and where you come from. And it was really hard for me to write the book probably because I had all these voices in my head of people being like, oh, it's just another savior story or oh, it's so opportunistic or it's another story about an indigent African-American who's rescued by a teacher. I was aware of all these voices and I was scared of them. Like, nobody wants to be thought of that way, especially me. But I had to shut out those voices and I told myself that I would write this if I, only by, if I were radically transparent. Um, yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. Do you know if Patrick has read your book? He, so I gave him the book. Um, I, I think probably, I can't tell. He, I read to him parts before it was published about his mother, and he hadn't known that his mother had said all these things about him, that she thought he was innocent, that she wanted him to come home. Um, so he, he, he wept when I, read to him her words, and that made me feel better about writing his story. Um, I don't know if that absolves me, but it made me feel better that I, he, heard, he heard her voice through, through the book. Um, I don't think he's read a lot of the other parts. I, my guess is that maybe he, like some of like being in jail traumatizes him. And his attitude about the book has changed depending on his situation, which makes sense. I think he was really excited about the book when he had a job, and he was less excited about it when he didn't have a job. And that, that's 
that makes perfect sense that we want people to know our story when we succeeded, but we don't want people to know our story when we don't feel like we succeeded. So, yeah. There's a question here. That was my question. Yeah. So how about, uh, have your parents read the book? <laughs> and if they have, do they have to come around with something that you might have made the right choice? Oh, I wish. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny with parents. My, my dad, his English is really good. He read the book really fast. I tried to hide the book like behind like the flower pot. He like found it and read it. He was proud. Um, but people are people. I don't. I don't know. Like, it's funny. The book was released in Taiwan, and it, it was such a different experience to be in Taiwan because every single person in the room who was older said to me or believed, you know, of course your parents are right. You know, I mean, there's it's like, of course your parents are right. And then they would also say, but you are right too. That's what makes it a complicated book that both you and your parents are right. And that was lovely in a way for them to just immediately accept my parents. Um, I'm just rambling. My mother started to read it, and her English isn't very good, but then she read the Chinese version, and I think she stopped when she got to the parts about her. I think it was very difficult for her to read about herself, even though I was very tender about her and her, um, her deep love and all her sacrifices, but I think it's really hard for parents to be written about. My dad grabbed the microphone at my reading in Taiwan and said to everybody in Chinese, when you find out that your kid is a writer, you want to take back everything you've ever said. <laughs> so parents, watch out! Just start being really nice to your kids. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, go for it. I'm just going to ask if you have siblings. Don't mention that. I do, I have an older brother who my parents totally worship. Um, I took that out of the book because I think it really upsets my mother when I say that. Uh, she's like, no, I love you equally. And I'm like, but you like him better, but you love us equally. Um, so I, I mean, I wondered through the writing process how much that influenced my own decisions. Just, he has so much presence in our, in our household. He just lights it up. He has lots of jokes. He talked really early on, he talked fast, he talked a lot, he won national debate tournaments. He was like a wonder kid, my parents had no idea where he came from. And I was really quiet, I was like a quiet, good girl. So my mom's whole narrative of me is that I became mad, like, in my senior year. <laughs> By which I think, like, she means I developed my own mind um, and started to talk more. So I, yeah, I have an older brother and I, I'm sure that shapes a lot of my conflicts with my parents, but I, I made the conflict seem more about immigration, but I'm sure like gender and birth order is all wrapped up in there as well. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Siblings are tricky. We yeah. always know who the parents' favorites are, even if they don't tell us. <laughs> yes. You describe yourself as a writer. You're a lawyer. And teaching seems to be past tense. Stay there? Well, I teach now. I teach college students, um, but maybe I use past tense because I think teaching in Arkansas was the hardest thing I've ever done. It's like, in my mind, teachers who do that are extraordinary. Teachers who work with kids are always extraordinary. Kids are so vulnerable and need so much, require a lot. Um, so. Teaching college kids feels more, I don't know, you can relax a little, although I'm still angry at them about some times. But yeah, and I, I still hesitate calling myself a writer. I think this must be a writerly thing to never quite think you're a writer, because um, each new project feels new. And then lawyer is past tense, um, but I hope that I can go back to it. I, I loved my time being a lawyer, but life happened, so I got married to somebody who moved to Europe and I had to follow him, being a bad feminist, good wife. So uh, <laughs> I have indeed followed him and I hope he can get a job back in the US. But he hopes so too, he's a historian. Yeah. 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 Y
Mm -hmm. It's good. Part of the story, too, is that it was really lonely in a rural area, which we don't talk a lot about, but oftentimes it's female professionals doing the service work. So many female teachers, female nurses, female mental health counselors in a rural area, but there's no, nobody to date. I was like very lonely, and it was a weird moment when I thought I didn't care at all about dating when I was 22, and then by, t by the time I was 25, all my friends were getting married. The only people coming into the rural area were younger women, which delighted the older male um, professionals who were there. And so I, it was, I don't know. Um, I, I, it's just I'm just rambling to comment on on becoming less radical as you want to have more of a private, blissful life. And, I don't like to tell young people that because I don't want them to feel like that's their inevitable route. You can be radical and have a blissful domestic life, but it's it's hard. It is harder to do both as you grow older. Yeah, you want the dog on your foot and the fire and the place and the glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hello again. Would you, um, I'm really curious what it was like when you first got there, it's sort of not part of your story, but you know, what was that like when you showed up and how did you run the classroom in the beginning, what kind of, how did, how was it to start to build relationships with those students? Um, it was really, it was, it was really hard. I, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I don't think any amount of like reading books would have me. I also didn't understand that the school would be so haphazard. You know, there was no guidance counselor, but there was a police officer. Half the teacher was substitutes. There was no library. Kids who got into fights were sent to jail. I had four principals my first year, four principals. The kids totally knew when, and principals were sent to our school as punishment. Like the city council would be, was mad at this one guy for, um, reporting the misconduct, so they said you be principal at the, at the alternative school. And then you sue them a second time for that, I think. Or maybe, I don't know how many times you sue them. And our fourth principal is now in federal prison for embezzling money from, I mean, it's just better than fiction. She was running a daycare program on the side while she was at her school, since she was never at the school, which is partly why students were running wild. And her daycare program took federal money for feeding kids, as a program for feeding kids, and she jacked up the numbers, and then the feds found her, so now she's in prison. Um, so it's just, it's just it, the kind of misconduct is unimaginable, um, the lack of leadership, the lack of like design. I mean, these are the kids who are the most likely to drop out, the most likely to cause crime, the most in need of mental health support, and the least, the least, yeah, they got nothing. They, they, screwed over from from this from from the minute they stepped foot in that school district. So it's just it's such a waste of potential, you know. Yeah. Yes. What was your favorite poem that you read with Patrick and could you no, do you have a line memorized from? <laughs> What's my favorite moment reading with him? What was your favorite poem that you read with Patrick? You gave us his. Oh, my favorite poem. Oh gosh, I have so many. Um, but there is a, Derek, a lovely Derek Walcott poem where he talks about, um, I'm trying to remember the exact line. Days that outgrow, days that outgrow us like harboring arms, I think, of a daughter. Um, and then I think I also love the haikus because they were so simple. They were so uh, accessible and simple and lovely, just like small images. So there is one of the first snow that falls where everything is enveloped in white and it's a deer licking first frost off each other's coats, which is lovely. And there's another, um, fun, there's a lot of funny poems. New Year's Day, everything is in blossom. I feel about average. <laughs> <laughs> and then another funny one is, don't worry spiders, I keep house casually. 
<laughs> so it's so great to like, it's so great to read those together, to not feel pressure to analyze them, and then to imitate them, to have a sense of humor and surprise. And yeah, I, I love, I loved, I loved those. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. It shut. It got shut down, but not because it was incompetent. Because there was a lack of money supporting it, and it's it's the story of the school is a lot it is really representative. It then got repeatedly vandalized, and then some students from Mississippi, or not students, or just people, um, set a car on fire at the school, burning up half the half the school. And I actually went back to see the school, you know, like last year, and I ran into this guy who was renovating it, and it's cool how in the midst of all this dilapidation, there's all these interesting, cool, quirky people. And he was an older guy who bought it for nothing and is refurbishing it, and he's not sure what he's gonna do with it. And he said that he had gone to this school in the 1950s when it was a segregated black school, and he said he loved it there. He said the teachers took care of them and that they, um, yeah, he loved going to school. He remembered like May Day, which is the day where everybody came out and ate corn dogs and played in the field. And that's why he wanted to refurbish the school to bring it back to when he remembered it. He didn't really know it when it was stars. Um, that's the name of the alternative school. So that, that was, it was like so lovely to meet this guy. It was great. Yeah. Hi, Betty. Um, I was wondering if you uh, could share your thoughts on perhaps a controversial topic of Teach for America. Yes. Um, because, you know, it's debate, you know, people debate, you know, and this is a good program for that. It's hard to say. You know, I have a lot of feelings with Teach for America. Some of them are conflicting. The things I will say that don't get said very much is that 50% of Teach for America teachers now are people of color. Um, a really high percentage of people who are uh, receive Pell Grants. Um, and we just don't hear enough about what Teach America does in rural areas. They send people to South Dakota, to Nevada, to Central Valley, California, to Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, South Carolina. I'm really grateful that there was a program that would send me with a community to a rural place. And I feel like when you analyze whether it's successful as a program, I really encourage people to analyze it locally, like to go to South Dakota, it forces journalists to go somewhere they don't want to go. Make them go there. Make them interview all the different teachers who are TFA, non-TFA. Interview the teachers who have stayed, ways in which TFA has helped the community or not. Interview the school board, what they think of TFA. Just start locally, because most of the anti-TFA stories are based in like in urban cities in Boston and New York, and I tend to agree with those critiques. But critics are completely silent about teacher shortages, about rural areas that will take somebody over nobody, and um, misunderstand rural communities that want TFA. I think TFA grew, grew really fast. That's the other thing we'll say. I wish it um, just focused on smaller communities and. and slower and then try to select more people who are more likely to stay. But I also think you can't predict who will stay. You know, I think I think it's hard for a program to figure that out. It's, a person will stay if they feel like very successful. Um, I have friends who still are in Arkansas 10 years later. They're total heroes to me. They're white and black. They're more heroic than a lot of like uh, liberals, you know, they're just doing the work there. And it's like, it bothers me when I see so many critical stories of TFA because I'm like, oh, but look at some of these people, they're just humbly soul teaching. Um, but I understand like the larger question is about unions and privatization. And I, f I feel like there's so much already said about that that I, I tend to. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm very conflicted about that stuff, so yeah, I don't know if that's enough. Yeah. Hi. Hi.
I ask one question, why did you use your legal skills to help Patrick? Why did you choose to read instead of? Yeah, so I cover that a little bit in the book, in the ninth chapter. So um, please read if you can. No, I'm just kidding. I never tell people to read my book. Well, you don't have to read my book, but I'm like, trying to grow as a person. So you read the next. But so, so this chapter um, is about trying to help him legally. And I think this is one of the tragedies of the book, of, of his story and in the book is that the legal system has so many constraints. What I really wanted him to do legally was to go for a jury trial and to argue self-defense or to argue provocation because the prosecutor had charged him with first-degree murder. And that was a total joke to me. First-degree murder is like buying arsenic and then planting it in your husband's soup, you know, on the day where He's extremely hungry, and it's his favorite soup. That's premeditated murder. It is not a drunken fight on your own porch. Um, and there are definitely legal doctrines that could have protected him. So that's what I think we would have done, and what I wanted him to do. But he didn't want that. And it's really fascinating and sad to consider why he didn't want that. One is the prosecutor had so much power that if they went to a jury trial and lost, that would mean going there for life. Nobody in the family wanted to risk that. Another is that Patrick himself felt really guilty about what he had done. And even if you try to convince him of all these sociological origins of what had happened, he's very Christian. He felt deeply depressed about what he had done. He didn't want to have to like talk about legal defenses. He didn't want to hear about legal defenses. Another thing is that he didn't want to further expose his family in a trial to have them each testify about what had happened. So when the, and I did work with the public defender and talked to the prosecutor, when they came back with this deal of manslaughter, which is three to 10 years, the public defender said, this is a great deal. When I called my lawyer friends, I said, that's a great deal. In my mind, I was like, but his life is over. Once he has a felony on his record, it's over. It'd be so much better for him not to have a felony. But the choices were so constricting. I wanted to be like a lawyer hero who um, got him off, but he didn't want to get off, and I think that's really complicated. It made me understand that violent offenders are very invisible in, in our national discourse. Um, like 50% of our state prisoners are violent offenders. Um, but during the Obama years, much of the talk was about nonviolent offenders because I think they were a topic that you could build coalitions with, with conservatives. And violent offenders tended to give conservatives more, more ammunition because violent offenders are scary and they destroy um, communities. But in reality, like we have to talk about violent offenders. We have to talk about their guilt, which I think will humanize them to conservatives. A lot of them are religious to talk about how they need mental help for the traumatic feelings of what they've done. Um, yeah, so that's, just, that's the long story of the, the, legal, the legal case. Yeah. Yeah, most, like 98% of, of arrests are, are, are adjudicated, they're not adjudicated, they're solved by plea bargain, so that was like a, that was like a, a really typical Plea bargain. I want to thank you all very much for coming and thank you, especially Michelle. It's been absolutely riveting.